So I heard you say in an interview, when the stakes get high, the human mindset asks, what do I have to lose? And the champion's uh, mind says, what do I have to gain? And I think there's a, a story that you've told that really captures this. You consulted a, a high jumper from the UK named Greg Rutherford, who was already performing at a really high level, but then started to melt down and they called you. And uh, I think this story is so fascinating because we assume that people at that level are sort of just have this iron clad mind that is, is not susceptible to this stuff. Now we, we all have the conflict 24 hours a day. We feel the restlessness of being uncertain, then confident, should I do this? And then should I do that? I mean, that's the, the battle that goes on every day for control over our decision making between our survival, hardwired biology impulses and our champion's deliberate mind that can apply the things that have to go right to win your gold medal. And so mm -hmm. Greg was leading the world championship. They came to me two and a half weeks before the Olympic final and said, Greg's melting down. What do we do? He's got the best coach. He's got the best equipment, has the best uh, sports psychologist, but yet he's starting to mentally unravel. What do we do? I talked to Greg and I said, Greg, this is really simple. You need to understand something here is that you're here at a place once in a lifetime opportunity and you're starting to mentally unravel. You're disconnected from your body, but this is not difficult to uh, unravel here. We still got two and a half weeks to do this, but you better listen up and listen to what I have to say. And I said that you're now operating up, up from your fear-based survival biology. And you guys mistakenly think that you have to put in a perfect jump to win the Olympics. And so you think the way that you deal with that is that you need to make a contingency for every possible scenario that could happen. And when you do that, you can put in the perfect jump. But we know your fear-based uh, mindset, human mindset, will always convince you that there's a detail that you haven't found that you put all of your confidence in that will help you and you must have to be able to win the Olympic gold medal. Therefore, it probably doesn't exist, so you've already lost. But if you do what the champions do, they realize that perfection is not necessary. And what does matter is that you do the one or two things that have to go right to win. And in this case here, Greg, you just need to go back to the warm up that you're used to doing because your body's familiar with that. When your body is around something it's familiar with, then it feels comfortable and it's going to perform for you. But when you start to change things, you start to shorten up your warm up, you try to make it longer, then the body gets confused. It doesn't know what to do. So it runs into the cave, it rolls the rock over the front, front. it doesn't want to come out, it doesn't want to play. So just please go back to your normal warm up. And the second thing is the first four steps to your run up determine the speed to hit the board to get the lift to win the long jump. That's all you need to do. Those two things, instant gold medal. Wow. So you're kidding me. I said, no, I'm not. We're looking at <laughs> historical evidence and data that tells us that that's true. I know it's hard to embrace it because your fear-based survival impulses are telling you another story, but it's not going to work. And so I said, this is all you need to do. You either trust me or you don't. The choice is yours. He said, well, I trust you, sort of, but I'll do it. I said, well, that's great. And so, um, you know, two and a half weeks later, he did only what I requested of him. Boom, won the gold medal. Uh, which is amazing, cried his eyes out, you know, on the podium getting his gold medal because, you know, he fought the fight that we all fight day in and day out. Are we going to go live a life based on our fear, let it control our decision making? Or are we going to take control of this and apply what has to go right that history tells us it has to go right to become our own champion, start to believe in ourselves and start to do these repeated uh, successes that create a, a massive legacy that can also teach other people how it's done. And then Greg went on to win the World Championship. He won the Commonwealth Games. He uh, won the European Games. He won everything that there was to win. And the single reason why he did it is that he had the courage to embrace the champion's mind and do the two things that had to go right rather than stress about everything that could go wrong. Wow, that's, that's such a great story. Great and story. It, as you were telling that story, Jeff, it, it reminds me of even like uh, football teams. I will not name the football team I'm thinking about, but it's in very close proximity to me here. But they'll get to the Super Bowl. And instead of just like handing it to the best running back in the league to, to run in for a touchdown and win the Super Bowl, they try a new play. Right. And Classic. how often do we change Classic. our game plan when the stakes Classic. are so high? Classic. As a matter of fact, uh, Mark, if people want to go to www.drjeffspencer.com. And one of the gifts that I give people is a paper that I wrote about this very thing. It's like, how not to blow it just before you win. That's exactly <laughs> the name of what it is. Please take the time everybody to get that. I think you find it valuable. But because I see this all the time, you know, when people are prepared to do it, and literally how you prepare is how you perform. But when you start to 
make it too important, you start changing things, it isn't part of your fabric yet. And because it's a fear-based um, impulse to try to do something different, to try to get the advantage rather than just to show up and do what you're prepared for, this is actually human nature and it's completely predictable that this would happen and it should not happen at all. But sometimes what we know people say about history is that we don't learn anything from history. No matter how many times you try it, it's never going to work. It never has worked and it never will work this time. Wow. Um, Jeff, I'd like you to speak directly to maybe a business person listening. So let's let's think about a scenario where the stakes are really high. Let's say they're walking into a sales meeting and they're pitching a huge client that if they land this account, it's going to change the trajectory of their life in the company. And so stakes are super high. What's your best advice to that business person when they start looking at, okay, what do I do? I've got this huge, huge thing and I don't want to blow it. Well, the first thing is to, to recognize why are you there? I mean, if the client didn't think you had something of value to them, you would not even be asked to be there. So you have to ask yourself, you know, what do I think about this? Well, that's a question you should ask yourself. So I have my clients to, well, I think that I have the solution to their problem and that's why I'm here, you know? Okay, great. Well, we sort of demystified the apprehension on that side of it. The second question to ask is like, well, who am I? Well, I'm qualified. I've been in the business for 30 years. Nobody knows the business like I do. Again, I can help this person. They're lucky to know me. And then the final thing is, is that when the door opens and you have to enter the room there, you just think about the first thing that you have to say. Don't try to go through all the scenarios or possibilities like Greg was confronted with hmm. to win the gold medal. You only think about what's the one word that needs to come out of your mouth that has to go right where then all of your preparation can be spewed forward to be able to crush the opportunity because what you've got is already there. It's just your job to get out of the way. It all starts with that first domino that falls, then everything else rolls off the tongue. Wow, that's great advice. Um, Dr. Jeff, I think we all have a perception that successful people are not susceptible to falling victim to the human mindset. But as you just mentioned, we, we really are. You were hired by one of the most iconic rock bands in history. You too, because they were having some problems. And, and uh, I'd love you to tell that story and, and what was the key to what you taught them? Well, first and foremost, that there are no exemptions or free passes from the battle that we all fight. If you really saw what happens behind the scenes is that every prolific achiever that does something of high significance, especially uh, in the presence of other people like you too, for example, there was 131 concerts over 18 months. It was a world tour. I mean, that's a lot of time and a lot of effort. I mean, you have to train for that like you would for the Olympics. It's that vigorous. And every concert that you do, everybody expects you to show up and play as if it were your first con uh, first uh, you know, concert. Yeah. So again, that's a matter of, number one, not feeling the compulsion to try to overpair, to be too perfect, to perform up to everybody else's expectations. You have to really manage your energy over time. You have to learn to not obsess about certain things that really don't matter. Uh, you need to trust in your preparation to be able to deliver. Uh, you have to be a great teammate and know how to communicate with your band uh, members. We need to give allowances and grace to ourselves and others for shortcomings when fuses get a little bit short in claustrophobic circumstances like that. We have to make sure that we keep our eye on the bigger picture of why we're here and what it is that we need to do to get to the promised land. And those are things that the prolific achievers and champions do. They, they never lose sight of the bigger picture. They know how to manage themselves and manage other people. They know how to show up and be of service to others. They, they know how to be a trusted teammate. And when we apply those things, then we have the glue that creates harmony in the system. And when we have harmony in the system, meaning all the people that are involved in this, then we get a predicted exponential output from everybody. And that's really the secret to this. It's not about working harder. It's about how do we have the fewest number of things in the system that are synergistic and compatible that when there's harmony in the system, again, leads to exponential output. So 